All right, good morning. Today we're going to review the Pathfinder Beginner's Box. Well, maybe not review, but we're going to unbox it and take a look inside. And the main reason why I want to do this is I'm doing research on beginner boxes. And with it, I have the Essentials Kit, the Starter Kit, and the Cyberpunk Red um, Beginner's Box as well. So I've already opened it. I've been mostly messing with my camera to figure out good lighting. And it did some early recording, but I'm going to start over because I am trying a different camera now. So let's get into it. So we don't get the unwrapping, but just imagine I unboxed this 10 minutes ago. Or open, unopened it 10 minutes ago. So there we go. So really nice, sturdy box. Um, I should probably show you the other edges of the box as well. So let's do that. So beginner's box. We have some character art. Um... More character art, beginner's box, pretty repetitive on the sides, um, with different character art on each edge. And then on the back side, we have some text, become a hero, leave the ordinary behind and take your first step into a world of amazing fantasy adventure with the Pathfinder Beginner's Box. This box contains everything you need to learn how to play the Pathfinder role-playing game, including the rules to create your own fantasy hero and tools to tell your own incredible stories. Will you be a courageous fighter, charging headfirst into battle, or a sly rogue, moving silently to strike foes from the shadows? Maybe you'll be a knowledgeable wizard, wielding incredible arcane spells, or a wise and pious cleric, using the power of your deity to shape the world for the better. It's all up to you. This box set is the perfect introduction to the world of Pathfinder, containing countless hours of thrilling adventure. This box includes a hero's handbook, a game master's guide, four pre-made heroes that you can start, some character sheets, over 100 character and monster pawns, that's cool, four game reference cards to help remember their actions, and a complete set of polyhedral dice. We have two to five players, ages 13 plus, at <laughs> time 60, 60 minutes. Weird that the minutes is vertical. Um, warning, not suitable for children under three years. That's because it's a box set. Um, US, done by Paizo, in Europe, by Ulysses, Spiel. All right, let's get into this. Whoop, come on. Oh, the joys of suction on boxes. And there we go. All right, so nice solid edges. Um, I like that with most boxes that you get, or most game boxes. We have what appear to be uh, little mounts for characters. For a character, um, that must be the, um, uh, what's it called, the tokens. Uh, so you, you can slot them in right in there, and then you have a little standing character. Um, and I'm sure there are, and you have a blue one and a large one, and a bunch of small ones. So that's interesting. We have some very colorful dice. Uh, I opened this one earlier, so. This very interesting orange, bright yellow, lavender purple, like coral red, and this like nice blue. Very interesting color choices, but they are bright, they are easy to identify, and I wonder if they will use these in the books, like use the colors and the shape to help identify uh, which dice you need to use when. Let's put those over there. Actually, let me put them on top of the... Put them off to the edge. We have a card for Sirenscape. Bring Galarian to life with the power of Sirenscape, a revolutionary app bringing immersive sound to music to your Pathfinder games with an easy interface. That's cool. Sirenscape. Uh, more than just loot repeating loops or a set playlist, Sirenscape uses complex algorithms and thousands of samples to create a sound that is frighteningly real. Download the Fantasy Player with 10 included sound sets for free. You don't even need to register. That's cool. That is really nice, actually. And then unlock a 30-day trial for the subscription. Make the most of your Pathfinder bucks. Get Siren Scout sound pack for Menace Under Otari. Otari. Experience Sirenscape makes. That's really nice. Um, that they include, a, like, not a sponsorship, but, like, something tied in with that. Read this first. So, first thing you get when you get into the box, aside from, like, the two elements just because of how the packing works, I would... It would make sense to have this, like, be on the top top. But, you know, packing, packing. Um, packing and production always make things complicated. So, read this first. What is Pathfinder? 
Pathfinder is a cooperative tabletop role-playing game, also called an RPG of fantasy adventure. Grab some friends and grab some friends to play the heroes in an adventure in an adventuring party. Go on a quest, explore mysterious environments, battle dangerous monsters, find treasure, and tell a story together. So they're telling you what your baseline is, explore environments, battle monsters, find treasure. That's a very interesting, um, I guess that's sort of like a remnant from 3rd edition. So some context, I've never played Pathfinder 2nd edition, I've played Pathfinder 1st edition back in the day, um, but I have not touched Pathfinder that much. So some of this, all the changes that happen in Pathfinder 2 2nd edition will be pretty much new to me, so I'm going to go through this and learn uh, with it. So if you're on your own, Pathfinder is designed for for group play, but this box includes a solo adventure that you can play on your own. Open the Hero's Handbook to page 2 to play Pirate King's Plunder, which will teach you the basics of the game. That's very interesting. To have a solo adventure? I mean, that makes sense. It also... It wasn't listed on the box, but it is something interesting to have. Like, oh, if you just got this, here is something you can do with nothing. Um, every group needs a game master to read and run the adventure. Pick one player to be the game master. The rest of the players will play fantasy heroes. So that's always something I've had an issue with is like, how do you decide who the GM is and why they should be the GM and what do they do? I always feel like I need to explain it. And this doesn't do that, but at the same time, does it have to? It's a question. Uh, if you want to start right away, grab one of the pre-generated character sheets. You could be the devout K K cleric Kira, or the powerful fighter Valeros, or the sneaky rogue Marisil, Marisil, uh, or the intelligent El intelligent wizard Erizin, Ezren. Uh, take the character folio for the character and cardboard pawn that matches them. If you want to make your own character, take the blank character sheet and turn to page 12, and this will guide you through character creation. If you want to become a game master, take the game master's guide for the game master. Uh, take this game master's guide the game master gm gets to know all the secrets and play all the monsters in the game okay so now we have our description of what the game master is turn to page two the game master's guide to read about the first adventure Minas under otari backside it looks like we have a picture of all of the things the character sheets the character sheet sorry empty character sheets pre-generated characters some flip maps character pawns the pawn holders reference cards dice and the guides Nice, simple, not too much text to overwhelm, but at least it's a starting point. Here we have some player reference cards. Looks like we have six of these. And what we have is we have checks, critical success, exceed the DC by 10 or more. Success, meter, exceed the DC. Failure, get the lower than the DC. And critical failure, get 10 below the DC. Interesting, so a 20 isn't a critical success anymore. Uh, rolling 20 or 1, if you roll a 20 on the die, increase the degree of success by one step. I wonder what that means. So like back in the D&D days, you roll a 20 and that was arguably a critical hit or an automatic success. Um, now that doesn't appear to be the case. So you either increase your degree of success by rolling in that 20 and you get a critical success by exceeding the DC which is an interesting change. Uh, DCs also, okay, I was like, what's going on with this uh, higher text hierarchy? But no, checks, DCs, and on your turn. And then rolling for 20 or 1 weirdly is taller than DCs, but it's within the checks. Um, play reference. So on your turn, you have three actions and one reaction. Uh, you can use three basic actions on and any others on page 65 of the Hero's Handbook, and any from your class. Speaking or dropping something doesn't take an action. So they make it very specific that speaking and dropping things do not take an action. Drop prone, fall prone. <coughs> Excuse me. Interact, manipulate, leap, seek. Scan an area for signs of creature or objects using perception. Oh, that's interesting. Concentrate secret. Interesting. Um, stand, move, step, move. So stand for prone, step, stride, move your speed, strike, 
So stride is move your speed, strike, attack, attack with a weapon, roll an attack against the target, AC. The multiple attack penalty is minus 5 on your second attack and minus 10 for your third, or 4 and 8, respectively, with agile weapons. So can you now choose to take multiple attacks at penalty? Like, if I want... Interesting. Oh, and then for rolling 20 or 1, if you roll a 20, increase the degree by 1 step. If you roll a 1, decrease the degree by 1 step. I'm still not sure what that means, but maybe we'll find out. And then we have a conditions on the back side. We have concealed, flat-footed. If you're concealed, you're difficult to target. You must exceed a DC 5 flat check without adding anything. When targeting a... When targeting you with an attack or spell effect, this applies only applies to abilities with targets, not ones where areas. If the check fails, the attacker spell doesn't affect you. A DC five. Interesting. Um, you're unable to defend yourself well. Uh, minus two penalty to AC flanking. <laughs> C flanking rolls. Oh, we love the flanking rolls. Frightened. You're this condition has a value. You take a status penalty equal to the value of checks. At the end of your turn, the value decreases by one. I like that. When it reaches zero, you're no longer frightened. So it's sort of like a... Um, it may start scary, and then over time, it diminishes. Very interesting. Uh, grabbed. Mm, we love the grabbing rules. You're held in place by another creature, unable to move, and you have flat-footed. Minus two penalty to AC. If you use the... If you use a manipulate action while grabbed, you must succeed a DC 5. Again, another DC 5. Interesting. Um, or higher, with no stats, or the action does nothing. How much? Okay, persistent damage. Instead of taking per persistent damage immediately, you take it at the end of each of your turns, as long as you have the condition, whichever gives you persistent damage, tells you the damage type, the dice you roll for damage. After you take, after you take persistent damage, roll a DC 15 flat check to see if you recover from the persistent damage. If you succeed, the condition ends. If you or someone else took steps to help you recover, like snuff out a fire, the DC is 10. Persistent, if you gain persistent damage when you already have one, the same type, you keep the one whichever is higher amount or die size. So if it's a 2d4 or a 1d8, you would technically take the 1d8, even though the 2d4 is more damage. Interesting. Oh, higher amount or die size, so that's arguable. Uh, prone, you're lying on the ground, you're flat-footed, minus two to AC, and take minus two penalty to attack rolls, standing up ends this prone condition. Restrained, you can't move, again minus two to AC, you can't use actions this time, except attempt to escape. Restrained is stronger than grabbed, so grab doesn't affect you if you're restrained. Slowed, you gain, when you regain point, your actions at the start of your turn, reduce the number of actions by your slowed value. Ah, so if we have three actions and I'm slowed one, I only recover two instead of a three. And then unconscious and wounded, there's too much text, so they refer you to the hero's handbook. There's six of these, one for each of the players, which is nice. And then we got playbooks. Let's see what we got. Cairo, Mesreal, Ezren, and then we have six character sheets. Um, looks like they are colored kind of closely. It's close enough, you know, printing, color, they're, so, they're close enough to match, so you know generally the yellow one is the D4. Um, actions, your three actions. Proficiency, is untrained is zero. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so there's no such thing as, like, maybe in the full game, there's, like, a bard who gets trained bonuses and untrained. Trained is 2 plus level, and expert is 4 plus level. This almost reminds me of the Saga edition, Star Wars, where it, like, added half your level um, to things. And then we also see, like, A, B, D, E... So there's a bunch of lettering, and I think these will correlate to stuff in the book. And then let's look, look at the skills as well. So acrobatics, arcana, athletics, crafting, deception, diplomacy, intimidation, lore, and then it gives space for text, medicine, nature, occultism, performance, religion, interesting occultism and religion are separate, society, 
So stealth, survival, and thievery. Thievery. Thievery, stealth, athletics, and acrobatics get armor reduction. And then our favorite saving throws. T and E, I wonder. Oh, trained and expert. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Unarmed defense. You mark whether you're trained. Weapon proficiencies. Oh, so you can you gain a bonus to your proficiency based on your level. And whether you're trained or expert. Interesting. And then on the back side, everything stays. Equipment, spellcasting, cantrips, spells, adventure along, notes and spellbook, and character portrait. It's... I always love having the character portrait on the front, but, you know, page, page is hard. Page layouts are always hard to do. And then we have our playbooks, it looks like. So, Kira, Kyra, the cleric. Oh, they also use their icons in the corners, which is really cool. Interesting. Oh, the thief has daggers and blood, weapons and shield, spell and wand, and then... Spellbook and scroll. Interesting. All right. So play a cleric if you want to support and heal allies with with divine spells. Know about religious writings and images. Oppose and destroy undead evil creatures. Wizard. Cast spells to devastate foes and protect allies. No secrets about magic. Solve problems with your magic. Rogue. If you want to sneak up on foes, deal more damage. Steal things without being seen. Excel at a variety of things. Play a fighter if you want to fight on the front lines. Use the best weapons and armor. React quickly to enemy actions. Okay. So, actually, let's start with the fighter. So, because these are probably all laid out the same. So, we have the first character sheet. Um, the font is kind of cool. It looks like it's handwritten. And then we see all these bubbles filled in as well. Whether they're trained. I don't see any expert unless on... Oh, so they add the bonus here. So proficiency is the bonus, and then they fill in both. And because he's a level one, right? Is he a level one? Yeah, level one. It's a four plus one, which gives him the five proficiency bonus. Interesting. Okay, and then on the right side, we have ancestry. You have extra hit points for being a human. So ancestry, human, background. As a farmhand, you're used to repetitive physical labor. Giving you the farm farming lore skill and the assurance ability for athletics checks. Assurance for athletics checks, you can use a result of 13 instead of rolling. That's cool. I always, I always wondered why this wasn't more of a thing um, in tabletop RPGs. Um, there's a cool Legends and Lore back in the development of 5th edition called D&D Next. And that this was one of those concepts that was talked about was like using results or your ability score to overcome rolls without having to roll them. So if like a poison had a DC of 12 and you had a 13 constitution, you wouldn't have to roll. Interesting stuff. Probably didn't fall through on playtesting or feeling like D&D, but cool stuff. Um, so speed, skills, things anyone... Skills are things anyone can do, like climbing, athletics, remember to use something in nature for a skill check, use... So it's a little reminder of how everything works. Equipment, get a lot of equipment. Attack of opportunity, they use a symbol, reaction, that's the first time I've seen the reaction skill so far. Shield block, sudden charge, and... Ooh, sudden charge is two. With a quick sprint, you can strike twice after moving. If you can reach any enemies with a melee attack, you can make a melee strike against one of those enemies. And on the back, we have some info about the character. Valorous was a month away from an arranged marriage to a farmer's daughter when he realized he didn't want to be tied down to one place for his entire life. He left in the middle of the night with a change of clothes, some food, and an axe handle for a weapon. He fell in with mercenaries who taught him how to wield a sword and wear heavy armor, but his good heart made him not want to work for cheats, swindlers, and sadists. He became an adventurer, making his own decisions about whom he'd fight and why. Ver Valeros is friendly and brave, though sometimes he gets in over his head and throws himself into battle with too much gusto. He's smart and doesn't let people talk to him like he's a brute. He is loyal to his friends, fond of a good mug of ale, and happiest when in the company of women. That's awkward. Um, that's an interesting character description for a fighter. Um... Especially the whole arranged marriage background. I mean, that does give some interesting, like, RP potential. Um, but I feel like it 
personally, it puts me it feels like it puts me in a weird position. But it's nice that they give you something to work with if you have nothing to work with, which I feel like I don't know. Like it's nice to have some backstory to give you like why you're like this. Um, I almost feel like something like the PTBA playbooks might be something a little nicer where it gives you something like to work off of like I left home because of A, B, or C and I enjoy A, B, or C to like make the character a little bit more of your own but overall let's here let me see let's look at the wizard the wizard Harry and so spell substitution you can expend 10 minutes to exchange one prepared spell that you have not yet cast ooh Arcane Bond, once per day, you can drain magical power stored in your staff to choose a spell. You can already cast today and cast it again. Lore Academia. And then Cantrips. A lot of these spells are double double actions, which is interesting, because that means you can move and cast. Um, or even cast an attack. That makes like Arcane Warriors very interesting. A magical Hand grasps a small object with 30 feet that no one was holding. You can move the object away slowly up to 20 feet. Message... Ray of Frost. Make a spell attack within 120 feet. If you hit, the ray deals cold damage, 1d4 plus your intelligence. On the critical, takes double damage and takes a minus 10 foot status penalty, penalty to its speed to its speeds for one round. To its speeds. That's okay. Like, little stuff like that. It's, you know, it happens. Editing is hard. Layout's hard. So the beginner box, Hero's Handbook. This is a nice... It's a good, it's a squeaky material. <laughs> uh, quick rules right on the back, just to like remind you if you don't need to open it. Strike attack. Note, attack rules take multiple attack penalty the second attack on your turn. Oh, because you have three actions if you take multiple attacks, since they give you the options if you attack twice or three times. Interesting. One die of the weapon size, if it's a melee attack. Strike damage, okay. Spell attack. Saving throws against spells, perception, stealth. Oh, okay, because stealth. I was like, why do they do perception and stealth and skill if they're all skill checks? But because they're against specific things, that's why they list it out for you, probably. Roll initiative. So combat sequence, roll initiative. Each player rolls for their hero, and the GM rolls for anyone else. And the results of the initiative are ranked in order of low, highest to lowest. The GM writes down and puts them in order. Play around, take turns. Initiative from highest to lowest. The results are tied. Enemies go before the heroes. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, moving on a grid. Ooh, oh, the joys. Looks like you... Oh, so diagonal movement is a 10-foot? Uh, because moving diagonally covers more ground, you count that movement differently. The first square of diagonal movement you make costs five feet but the second counts as ten feet ah interesting so mathy way to go about it begin the next round in the encounter when everyone on one side is defeated or something else ends the combat that's nice they don't like say when everyone's dead um bonuses cover typically one plus plus one to ac or standard cover plus two AC reflex and stealth. Oh, that's interesting. It gives you a bonus to stealth. It allows a creature to use the stealth still to hide. All right. So another again a reinforcement of character. Uh, so not a reinforcement of character creation because we haven't gone over it yet. But you see the character sheet again uh, with the blank character sheets. You start create a concept. Start with the ability modifiers. It's an interesting place to start. Oh, and will increase as you build your character. Okay, so they're kind of letting you know that this will change as you go. Select an ancestry, only three, nice and simple. Uh, background, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I wonder why they didn't do four, four there and just push this down a little bit, but okay. Uh, choose a class, cleric, fighter, rogue, and wizard. The standard like RPG tropes. Buy equipment, finish your hero, all the other stuff, write them down. And then table of contents. So we've got the solo adventure, which is interesting to have first. An example of play, getting started, creating your hero, skills, playing the game, and then leveling up. So the first is the solo adventure. So you're a wandering adventure visiting. We're not going to go play through it, but I just want to read the first 
Your wandering adventure visiting Otari, a small town on the coast of Starstone Isle, an enormous island magically raised from the ocean by an ancient god. Otari is renowned for its lumber and fine wooden boats. But it's not what brought you here. You came looking for adventure. I don't know. Fine wooden boats can definitely lead to adventure. Uh, word has it, a vicious beast is preying upon the town's livestock, and the mayor has offered ten gold coins to any hero who can put an end to the menace. Only ten? That kind of money would pay for expenses for a month. Ah. So... That is true. Uh, that's always one of the awkward things about role-playing games is gold economy. Um, after asking around at a nearby tavern called the Crow's Casks, you learn that most of the attacks occur on the western side of town, not far from the shore. That seems like the best place to start your search. You gather your belongings and make your way along the rocky beach to begin your hunt. It doesn't take long for you to find the entrance to a dark, mysterious cave. Large paw prints lead to and from the gloomy opening. Go to entry 13. That's interesting that it, entry 1 leads to entry 13. Um, because of, you would think that a choose your own adventure would try to be as linear as possible in terms of like moving around. Noticing the track leading to the cave, you hide nearby. Fangs hang in the air. One thing I don't like is how it makes me turn the page right away. Um, but layout. Uh, emerging from the bushes, wolves carrying the body of a dead chicken. Poor chicken. Clearly this is the beast of the run. You are now in combat with a wolf. Okay, so they're sort of like directly attacking. You attack, rolling the 20-sided die, adding your bonus. Um, your AC, your hit points, wolf's AC, wolf's hit points. Combat occurs in rounds. Each round, you and the wolf take turns. So your actions. Hide in the bushes. The wolf's actions. Finally, if your attack roll exceeds the wolf, remember if you go first. If you defeat the wolf, if the wolf defeats you. Okay. Your vision grows dark as life leaves your body in your final moments. You can't help but think that this is not how story should end. Maybe the next hero should fare better in, the, in this deadly place. Uh, although you have died, there are still adventures to be had. You can start this adventure over by turning to entry 1. You are restored to full hit points, but so are the foes that you have faced. You must explore and face whatever dangers await you all over again. Alternatively, you can start making your own character and play in adventures with others. Go to page 12 and design beginning your own hero. That's cute. <laughs> no adventure should end like this. Uh, we have an example of play, so we have GM, Lies, Mark, Logan, and... Uh, are we sure we're going on? Let's see... I'm just curious if they use pronouns. Not really, it's hard to see, but it's nice that... Oh, it's a single page, too. It's a single page example of play, which is always kind of tricky. Getting started. What's a role-playing game? Dice. Basic rules. Rolling checks. Actions. Basic concepts. There's always so many basic concepts. And then character creation. Or now this is a reiteration. I do love the sketch art to flat, art, flat colors to full detail. That's a nice little, like nod to character creation of like how you flesh out your character building modifiers pick an ancestry build a step oh now they explain your ability scores your ancestries I'm not a fan of the greenish background but it works uh, since there's a lot of green going on here uh, choose your ancestry you gain a set of benefits for each member of the ancestry dwarfs can see in the dark elves can move more quickly but humans would Ancestries aren't monolithic. Each ancestry has three heritages uh, that grant additional benefits. Okay, so we have dwarf. Pick a dwarf heritage. Death warden dwarf. Damn. Um, interesting. So they have like little sections. If you pick the dwarf ancestry, write dwarf in the ancestry section of your character sheet. A. And then you get the following benefits. Dwarves are both sturdy. Add plus one to both your constitution and wisdom in section D. Hit points. Ten max hit points in section E. That's very nice. So, like, you have, like, a reference to go back into the character sheet and be like, oh, I need to go here. I need to find thing. Now, yeah, it's just an additional little, like, helper. Um, backgrounds. Nice big page art, too. And nice thick paper. And then a class. Again, we're seeing a lot of. You're not un. You're untrained in anything not listed unless you gain a better proficiency rank in some other way. 
Um, and then check the T box. Okay, so they're doing spell casting shield block. You raise your shield to block a physical attack, reduce the amount of damage by five. But then you and your shield both take the remaining damage. Oh, that's interesting. They actually do shield damage in this. Ooh, heal one, two, or three. You can target one creature you can touch. You target a creature within 30 feet. That's nice, a way to make it ranged. Although you could move and then heal, depending on the tactical necessary. You affect all living creatures and undead creatures within 30 feet. Nice. This is a cool way to scale. I was, there was interesting potential with this um, action economy system that they introduced. Most of them are two or more though, which is interesting. Second level, add eight to your constitution, eight plus to your constitution to your maximum hit points. So it's a flat, a flat bonus. Again, strong use of the iconography. I feel like I've seen this symbol somewhere, but it's nice. Um, intimidating strike, fear and mental. Uh, your blows not only wound creatures, they shatter their confidence, make a melee strike, and if you hit, deal damage, the target gains a frightened one condition, or frightened two if you strike it with a critical hit. So that's the one thing that we haven't seen is the what the steps of success are. I do like Rogue if you want to, and then it has all the stuff in it. And they tell you directly what like second level, third level options. Wizard, all your spells. Also, mostly two. There's a couple ones here, like Protective Ward, Physical Boost. Temporarily improve the target's physique. One creature you touch gains a plus two bonus on the next acrobatics, athletics, fortitude, or reflex save it attempts. Interesting. Very cool. Equipment, more character art again, um, and then fighter, breastplate weapon, adventuring gear. If you are a brute, you have a choice of a great sword or an axe. If you're a shield fighter, okay. So they have money left over, and then maybe some options with that. Carrying and using items, held, worn, or stowed. Held items are in your hands. You can hold one item in each hand or one two-handed item using two hands, using both. Um, worn items are tucked into pockets, belt pouches, bandoliers, weapon sheaths, and so forth. You can retrieve a worn weapon with this worn item with a single action, putting it back with another action. And then you can drop an item, and then stowed, blah, blah, blah. stowed items are in a backpack or a similar container. You have to spend an action to take off the backpack before you can spend time to interact and retrieve it. Ah, so they're adding... So if I wanted to get something from my backpack, it would take me an action to remove, one action one action to remove, a second action to retrieve the item, and then the third to use it. Interesting. Many ways using items for multiple actions, therefore making a strike with a dagger worn on the sheath. At your belt requires the using an interact to draw the dagger, then using a second action to strike. Likewise, if you have draw potion, you must take it. Because you could now draw a weapon from your sheath, attack, and put it back. Or if it's in your backpack, you'd have to put down the backpack, draw the item, and then use it. But you could also draw, move, and attack. Or move, draw, and attack. So you, it's interesting. Um, and it makes it a lot cleaner, at least, in terms of like how those free actions work in the action economy. Armor. The joys of donning and doffing armor. And yes, that is the correct term to doff. Um, speed penalty. Classic armor. Flexible and noisy. Oh, interesting. Oh, and of course our dex cap and strength threshold. Star knives. So we get our weapons list. Deadly, Agile, Throne, Versatile, Shove. A big book with notes. Um, this is the equipment. Kind of standard. And then finishing your hero. Defenses, names, pronouns, that's a nice addition. Skills. 
Oh, now we have untrained actions. Let me see what that means. Recall. So they're giving you options of how to use. Recall knowledge page 50, hide, sneak, sense direction. Do they have like, oh, trained actions. Okay, so now they're saying like, you can do all these things and they use these skills. Um, and then if you're trained, you can do these things using those skills as well. Okay, so they're really writing out like what your actions are. Um, Grapple, oh boy. Oh, I wanted to see if they had a... Because now they're saying critical success. Here we go, so... Uh, critical success, you understand the meaning of the text? Oh, so if you get a 10 or more. Critical, if you believe you understand the text, we have misinterpreted. So they don't really go into... Uh, the GM sets the DC of a skill using the guidelines. Uh, decent chance to succeed, like a low DC 10, trained 15, 20 for extremely trained or experts. Okay, so they don't really go into the bumping up a step or bumping down a step. Bunch of skills, medicine. Hope did I miss a thing here? No. I can pick a lock. Successes. Oh, you have to do it more than once. So success, you achieve one success towards opening the lock. Okay, so you have to do it multiple times. Which is nice that they add that. Playing the game, rolling checks. Step one, roll. Determine success. Okay. So if you roll a 20 or a, if you roll 20 on the d20, use a, use a result one step better than what you normally get based on your roll. This changes a critical failure to a failure. Okay, so you're literally just moving up one. So if you roll a nat 20, if you get a success, you get a critical success. Or if you got a failure, now you have a success. Kind of, that's interesting. So now, I wish that was it before the skill section because that would make a little more sense. So some things don't give you critical success. I mean, they can be narrated. Critical success, your performance impresses the observers and they're likely to share their stories of your ability. You prove yourself to observers and appreciate the quality of your performance. Your performance falls flat. You demonstrate only incompetence. Oh. All right, so now we understand that a little bit more. Light and darkness, oh boy. Um, investigate, defend, avoid notice, hustle. So it's pretty much everything you're gonna need when you're doing a starting adventure. Um, basic actions, again, the list of actions. Again, next round, so this is combat, attacking, damage, difficult terrain. Getting knocked out. Dying, recovering, wounded. If you're wounded, immediately move your position directly before the you reduced to zero. Gain dying one. Effective knocked over was a critical success. Oh, interesting. So dying is a bit. If you ever reach dying four, you die immediately. Oh, okay. Leveling up. Beyond third level, getting knocked out. Notable traits. Ooh, non lethal. Recovery. Cool. A lot of stuff in there. And then... Oh, interestingly. Oh, interesting. Pathfinder best year. So under inside of the box edge, they have product. Oh, that's the uh, OGL. The core rule book. They have like a little write-up on each of the books. Additional books that you can purchase. Um, so this is the Beginner's Box Game Master's Guide. In it, we for, first thing we see is a map. Adventure, Menace, Other Oath, Game Mastering, Building Adventures. Okay, so magic items, environments, hazards, and then more of the adventure. So 
This book is for Game Masters, and inside this book you'll find wondrous adventures, deadly monsters, and fantastical treasures. These are secrets that other players will discover through you, the Game Master. Your job at the game table is to act as a narrator and referee for the rules of the game. Well, e while each other player takes on the role of an individual hero, as the GM you'll take on the roles of the monsters, resolve traps, and play any other creatures the heroes encounter in their journey. If you'd rather play a hero, stop reading now. <laughs> uh, give this book to a friend so they can be the GM. Uh, yeah, okay, so as the Game Master you get to work with all the other players and, and see how the story unfolds. While each while they'll each play their individual hero, you'll assume the role of all the monsters, villagers, and other characters they encounter, you decide how those people and monsters act and what they do in combat and intriguing clues they might give to the heroes. You will also describe each area the heroes explore so that other players can imagine the setting and decide how their heroes respond to what's going on around them. There are tools to help you shape the story. It's important to remember you're not playing against the players. That's very important. This is a game where everyone wins if, if everyone has a fun time. Monsters are meant to be defeated and treasure is there to be found. Try to make the players feel like they've earned their success without being too tough on the heroes trying, they're trying to play. Now they're playing. The first adventure, uh, designed to be played for a force first level heroes, but it works for two or three heroes with only a few slight adjustments. Uh, give the players 10 to 15 minutes to look over the character sheet so they learn. Uh, running this adventure. So each section of the adventure will teach new concepts as you need them, adding more and more to the game. Meanwhile, other players we each have an entire hero to roleplay, learning as to how they use their abilities and how to succeed. This adventure, like most published adventures, is presented in a series of areas to explore and challenges to face. Each one is tied to a location on a map coded with a number. The dungeon consists of two levels. The map is for the first level that is located on the inside of the front cover, and the map is for the second level. This box includes a fold-up map containing both levels, one on each side. Whew. As the game proceeds, players will take turns moving their pawns around the map as they explore the dungeon. Okay, the players will use their hero's ability skills. Getting started, one player is a cure. Once everyone has chosen their hero, begin. Okay, and then it starts with our favorite box text. The small seaside town of Atari is known for its fresh and skilled sailors. Or fresh fish, sorry, not fresh sailors. Um, but above it all, it is, log it is a big logging town, providing valuable wood to the nearby metropolis of Absalom. But for you, Atari is home. You grew up playing on the docks, getting lost in the nearby woods, and hearing the fantastical stories from travelers from faraway lands. The tales of terrifying dragons and virtuous knights. Such adventures always seemed so distant, but until today. The world has begun to spread around Otari, that there's a problem down at the Otari fishery. Some are saying that there's some sort of beast lurking in the basement, feeding on the stores of salted fish. Folks are worried that whatever's eating the fish might get hungry enough to eat the fishers next. You've received a letter from Tammy T Tandreville, Tandreville, the owner of the fishery. Inside is a desperate plea for help. With the town guard busy protecting the loggers, she needs a few brave souls to venture down into the basement of her warehouse and put an end to the beast that is feasting on her fish. Do you have the courage to face the men menace under Otari? Once you've finished reading, have the players introduce their heroes to one another, including their name, ancestry, background, and class. Players might also want to describe what their hero looks like what kind of gear they carry, and a little bit about their personality. You can always show them a picture of Tamalee on this page so they can see who's asking to, for them to take on this task. After introductions, place their pawns on the stairs leading into the basement of Area 1. The order is up to them to decide, but it's smart to put characters more hit points first. <laughs> Alright, so we got Hungry Rats. Round of Combat, Combat Guide to help you know how to run combat. And then the stat block for the rats. Five low vision, AC, four ref will. Or fleas, defeated or fleas. You don't need to track actions anymore. That's nice to remind people. Drop into darkness, the spider's web. What's really nice about this is it sort of goes in, not goes in order, but at least it feels like those are very cool kobolds. Dry fish, flanking the kobold fight. The kobolds are busy trying to pry open. Oh, let's just say abandoned storeroom. This large store, this large room looks like it was once a storeroom for building, for a building above. At the far side, you can make out what might have been a cage or cell at some point, but is now full of crates and barrels. Four lizard-like creatures, the size of human children, are clustered around the door of the cell, trying to pry it open. 
See, I think this kind of box text is very nice because if you're starting out, this gives you a place to start the action or like the what do you do kind of thing. Very cool. Very interesting kobold art. I've never seen that before. I must. I wonder if that's a new Pathfinder standard for the kobold art. Elements of chaos. God, this cave goes. Mermaid fountain. Kobold warren. Experience points level up. Ooh, that's cool. Dragon keeper. The kobold boss. The mushroom grotto. This is quite the game mastering, okay. So common terms, challenge, encounter, exploration, session, adventure, and campaign. Character creation, sessions, preparing, and adventure. Uh, before you can run the game, you need to prepare the adventure, the group will play through, and adventure is self-contained collection of story elements, characters, and settings that become a basis of a story and you and other players tell. Think of the adventure as an outline for your story, all the major plot points you'll want to include, some consistent characters and themes you'll want to convey, but all sorts of things can change during the story process, turning into the outline into a completed story. The Menace Under Otari adventure has much of the preparation done for you, reading the adventure and looking through the materials in the beginner's box gives you enough preparation to run that adventure. This and other pre-written adventures are built for groups of a specific level. They include setup information for NPCs needed for the story, plus all the locations, maps, and monster groups. They also give the appropriate amount of XP and treasure. Running your first game will see how adventures are structured, which will make it easier for you to write your own later on if you choose. Changing details in an adventure to suit your group is, isn't just okay, it's preferred. Adjust things to make the adventure appeal to your players more. Adding adjust things to make your players... Uh, and add adventures... Add to the adventure in ways that will make your players happy. Very cool, very cool. Starting a session, planning a session. Mm -hmm. Less than two hours usually isn't enough time to get something done. Um, running a session, the spotlight. Keep track of which player has a spotlight. You can easily keep attention on the most... Outgoing hero, but you need to check in with all the players. That's nice. Secret checks. Oh. Some rules work better if the player doesn't know the result of the rule. For instance, recall knowledge action from the skill and give false information on a critical failure, so the player shouldn't know whether their hero succeeded or not. So the GM rules for that? Hmm. These actions have a secret trait. For the secret check, as ask the player what their statistics is for the skill. Roll the d20 somewhere where the players can't see and calculate the results. That's very interesting. I'm... I'm not sure what I feel about that. I mean, it's definitely a way to keep information from the player who shouldn't know the result. So it is a good way of doing it, especially in a standard like D&D style, Pathfinder style game. So that's, it's, a, it's an interesting move. Set party order, exploration activities, avoid notice, defend, detect magic, hustle, investigate, scout, search, sense direction, track. I feel like they could have moved this here and had that there so that could be the whole page, but that's just me. Improvising new actions, hazards, rolling initiative, character placement, encounters, ending in characters, surrender and escape. Very nice to killed or knocked out. Once this happens, you stop acting. Escape. Here's may want to pursue. Uh, if you run round by round, it will get boring quickly. Ask anyone who wants to pursue the flaming enemy how they pursue. If they use a spell or ability that seems really helpful and their speed isn't much slower than the escaping enemy, they catch the enemy. So they automatically... Ah, oh, that's interesting. If the heroes decide to flee, it's best to let them do so. Pick a location on the map and allow them to escape once they reach it. Interesting. That's very nice that they have those written out. I wish they were more emphasized. Experience points. Creature level minus one and zero. That's very interesting. Party size accomplishment. That's nice. So now you can give them XP based on their accomplishment level. Difficulty class. Standard tables. DC adjustments. And then level based DC checks. Oh, Recall Knowledge, Untrained, the name of a ruler. Okay, so that's nice. They give you examples of, um, so Recall Knowledge, a untrained check, DC 10 is the name of a ruler, a key noble or major deity, DC 15, trained, the line of succession for a major noble family, core doctrines of a major deity or expert, genealogy of a minor noble, teachings of an ancient priest. 
Um, so it's nice to see examples of that and like what a difficulty would be. Building adventures, strange rooms. So mapping tips, avoid empty rooms. Do not add too many empty rooms as they can clutter your map and get boring repetitive quickly. Leave room for expansion unless you're certain you don't want to return your dungeon. Allow for places to explain later for future adventure. Avoid symmetry. Oh, but symmetry is so nice sometimes. Refrain from creating symmetrical dungeons in which half the exact mirror is of the other. It's unrealistic and players might be disappointed when they realize they only have to explore half the dungeon to see it all. That is true. Uh, room shapes instead of a bunch of rectangulars include oddly strange ones alcoves at regular caverns, use wide corridors. Remember that combat is based on five foot squares. If you fill your dungeon with five foot wide hallways, you might end up with combats where some of the heroes can't actually get into the fight. Don't make a maze. Strange rooms, monster barracks full of filthy straw nests, narrow ledge overlooking a chasm, natural chimney in the rock where the heroes can climb up to reach a higher level, ancient library covered in dust. Okay, so these are just, don't forget latrines, really. Pets where guard animals are kept. Severe threats, low encounter threats. Okay, so they're giving you examples. Hazards, role play. Some treasures by level and price. Ever burning torch is only 15 gold? It used to be a 50. That's totally worth it. Consumables. Oh, interesting. It's like they scaled down the gold economy a little bit, which is nice. Uh, environments. Sights, sounds, smells, and textures. Sights, sounds, smells, textures, and weather. Very cool. So trees, things to do with the trees, underground, undergrowth, vines, canopy, sounds. I like this. This is something I need to do more of. Um, is provide more urban we have crowds doors rooftops sewers stairs and walls climate thunderstorms precipitation fog and how it can affect hazards hazard xp so hidden pit spear launcher reaction when a pressure is applied to the tile oh it's interesting they make them reactions I mean, I guess if you're doing, if you're moving players around step by step. Oh, is there anything about damaging a hazard? Damaging a trap looks like damaging a shield. The trap reduces the damage it takes by its hardness. If a hazard's hit points are reduced to its broken threshold or lower, the hazard becomes broken and can no longer be activated. If reduced to zero, it is destroyed and cannot be repaired. Usually trap triggered when attacked, though though it isn't triggered. If it's destroyed in one hit because there isn't a left to harm anyone, it's broken. Interesting. So we have notice, description, disable, AC, fort, hardness, and HP. Okay. Interesting. Some fancy armor. Using items. Magical items. Juan's ladder feather token. Creatures, skills to identify, description of the trait, which is nice, it's animated armor, basilisk, boar, bugbear, leopard, it's giant centipede, because we love those, a doppelganger, I'm surprised at seeing that, a drow warrior, drow priestess, creature one and creature three, with the dragon being a four. Elemental shark, uh, cinder rat. So it's nice that they're giving you some elemental options in here as well. A common ghost, or a com ghost commoner. Goblin commando, goblin igniter. So we have a bunch of. Wait, what was this guy on the right? Gremlin pugwampy. Gremlins are cruel fae tricksters. Saboteurs enjoy causing inventive destruction. This dog faced pugwampies are craven and take great joy in accidents and missteps caused by the ill fortune they magically project. Harpy, Hellhound, Hobgoblin, Kobold Mage, more Kobold, 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 a chair that will eat you, Mimic, the Ogre Warrior, Ogre Commander, Ogre Scrapper. I like the art method of like stat block art, stat block art. 
owlbear because owlbears are awesome. It is interesting that, like, you know, based on how big the stat block is, is how much text they get. Um, and so therefore they keep the text all uniform. Skeleton, 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 snake, snake, snakey snake, spiders, trolls, web lurkers, whites, wolves, Xoglath, or Zulgath, zombie shambler, and then Otari, the adventure. And this goes over each of the NPCs, it looks like, and locations, story seeds, and again, a reference. A lot of references. We got a, ooh, wow. This is very thick. This is almost like, it's not GM screen thickness, but it's like, it's thicker than the cover. Ooh. I don't want to break it. Now this is a map. Uh, apologies for not fitting it. So this must be the dungeon side. And then there's the upper side. And then let me flip this over. Wait. Oh, and then there's the temple. Or the chaos. Wow, this is thick. Nice high quality map. Almost, I would almost call it a too thick, but. And then last but not least, we have our punch outs. So we have our action punches out, our reaction. Oh, interesting. So you could give these to players and they could like figure out what they wanted to do with their action. Uh, and then we have, I think one of every creature at least. So this is one, two, three, four sheets. Um, oh no, they include a couple doubles too, just in case, um, depending on the creature. There's a lot of rats apparently. So one, two, three, four, five, like five rats already. And then your characters as well. Some more wolves, some skeletons. And then last but not least, Pathfinder Society, a world of adventure, exploration, and intrigue that awaits. Join the Pathfinder Society today. Claim your heroic destiny in a Pathfinder, global Pathfinder campaign with more than 100,000 players. Explore the thrilling world of Lost Omens with monthly short adventure scenarios. Engage with a vibrant community of players and develop friendships through the Pathfinder Society's enormous shared world campaign. The adventure contains, continues. Troubles on Otari. Oh, so they actually can do and continue the adventure or have a, an adventure continued. Uh, core rulebook, advanced player's guide, best theory, game master ride. So core book, get all the essential rules to play Pathfinder in one book, play characters from one to 20, with the expanded rules for every part of the game, including new classes. Uh, so you can play a goblin, gnome, or halfling, find more classes, more skills, magic items, including animal companions and familiars bestiary advanced players expand on the core book with more character options okay so that was wondering what they were going to do um explaining because the core book has everything in it and then get the tools you need to run your own adventures very cool and there we have it that is the pathfinder starter box my opinions, or at least my first impressions, is that this is a very high quality box. Um, I believe the sticker price was, I wanna say 40, but yeah, $39.99. So the sticker price was 40, so it is, a, I mean, pricey is kind of a relative thing. So it is a buy-in, um, but it does contain everything you need and probably a bit more just to get started. Uh, but honestly, this is a great starter set. It has a lot of good materials, a lot of explanations to the rules, uh, and a good way to get started if you're looking to get into Pathfinder. Uh, my takeaway is looking at, um, one is the minis, which I think are really interesting, and the playbooks. Those are the two biggest things that I'm, well, the playbooks and the, um, the reference card, um, because those are sort of the, oh, I didn't grab actually the thing I wanted to show. 
So the playbooks are cool because you hand this to a player. It's got everything you need. Um, looking at this the first time, I would have to read the beginning to know exactly what's going on, but at least it explains to some degree, like, class, you're a wizard, which gives you your spells. Skills, these are things anyone can do. So, like, if you didn't know, you can read the reference, and it would explain it to you, which is nice. Especially if you give this to a player, they have time to learn. Um, they do explain the actions a little bit. Um, I probably would want to maybe have a little more explanation to that. But overall, this is solid. All right, well, the next one will probably be the Essentials, the D&D Essentials and D&D Starter Set. And that is the Pathfinder's Beginner's Box. If you enjoyed the video, thank you so much. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.